from West Virginia Public Broadcasting. Support for the legislature today is provided by the following. AARP West Virginia, your ally for real possibilities in the Mountain State. Online at aarp.org slash wv. West Virginia University. Online at wvu.edu. At the legislature today, senators struggled to get answers from the attorney who wrote the chamber's tax reform proposal, while in the House, dozens come out to speak against an abortion bill. The state's Secretary of Transportation details the governor's plan to build more than a billion dollars in new roadways, and we take a trip to the state archives, coming up on the legislature today. Good evening, I'm Ashton Mara. Under a tax reform initiative in the Senate, West Virginians would pay a lower rate of income tax, but higher sales and property taxes. That is, if both a Senate bill and a constitutional amendment make, amendment make it through the legislative process and are approved by voters. The Select Committee on Tax Reform and a Senate Finance Subcommittee discussed the changes this morning, which members on both sides of the aisle say they have concerns over. Senate Bill 335 is the upper chamber's attempt to overhaul the state's tax structure. It's already been approved by the Select Committee on Tax Reform and was taken up by a Senate Finance Subcommittee Monday morning. The bill increases the state's sales and consumption tax from 6 to 8 percent. It also reduces the personal income tax to a flat 2.5 percent for all income brackets. It sets financial thresholds for the state to incrementally repeal the income tax, corporate net income tax, and reduce the severance taxes on coal and natural gas. Many members of the subcommittee are also members of the Select Committee on Tax Reform, with the exception of Democratic Senator Cory Palumbo of Kanawha County. Palumbo questioned Mike Carl, a consultant for the Select Committee who helped write the legislation. My concern about this, this bill in general has been that um, my perception of what it's going to do is shift tax burden from higher income people to lower or middle income people. Have, have we done any kind of assessment on that? N not in a formal way. Carl is a former state tax commissioner under Governor Arch Moore, and he and Palumbo work at the same Charleston law firm. Carl says food stamps will remain exempt from the 8% food tax that will take effect under the bill. It also contains an earned income tax credit for working families and a fixed income tax credit for low-income seniors to prevent a larger burden. Palumbo questioned Carl about those tax credits. As I understand from your explanation, those would only kick in if the people approve the constitutional amendment. Did I understand that correctly? That's, that's the way it's written, yes, sir. So what happens to them if it doesn't? Uh, there's a powerful incentive to pass the amendment. That constitutional amendment was presented to members of the Select Committee on Tax Reform earlier in the day. Along with amending the Constitution to include the changes made by Senate Bill 335 and creating the tax credits for low-income working families and seniors, the amendment also phases out the state's personal property tax, a tax the average citizen pays on their vehicles and companies pay on large equipment. It replaces the revenue with an increased real property tax, or the tax on homes, building, land, and minerals. So in order to approve tax credits for low-income workers, the voters would also have to approve an increase on their own property taxes. I wasn't in the, obviously in the tax reform committee, but what was the logic behind tying those tax credits to the adoption of the amendment? I, th I think it's pretty, pretty obvious logic. Uh, I think it made the, the amendment a lot more politically viable. Carl had few answers for the subcommittee about the revenue either generated or lost by the bill, including the change away from West Virginia's current tiered personal income tax of 3 to 6.5 percent based on income to the flat 2.5 percent rate. What is it anticipated that that would generate? Uh, again, I'm not the numbers guy. I don't... Uh, uh, I, I, I don't have my, I have a, uh, notes on that, but I can't really tell you. Okay. I'm sorry. 
Carl says, however, the bill was initially calculated to create a $610 million deficit for the state in three years, but several provisions have since been changed. He says the current bill will stimulate the economy and produce revenue surpluses down the road. The subcommittee made only one change to Senate Bill 335 during the Monday meeting. Senator Greg Boso amended the bill to decrease the coal severance tax from its current 5 to 2.5 percent over three years instead of two years, as the bill initially proposed. Republican Senator Craig Blair says it's the ability to make those kinds of changes that make him a supporter of the legislation. This has been one of the most my years in the legislature, one of the most flexible pieces of legislation that I've ever seen. Uh, it, it has the ability to change and morph and, and, and work its way through. The two Democratic members of the subcommittee still had concerns about the bill. Palumbo with the shift of tax burden from high income to low income West Virginians and Senator Bob Plymouth with the impact an 8 percent sales tax would have on businesses in border areas. The subcommittee, however, voted to send the bill back to the full Senate Finance Committee with the one severance tax amendment made by Senator Greg Boso. As for the constitutional amendment that accompanies the bill, members of the Select Committee on Tax Reform were presented with the language for the first time today. But the committee's chair, Senator Robert Carnes, says they'll put it to a vote later in the week. Almost every legislative session, lawmakers take up bills that change the state's sentencing guidelines for judges. This year, a handful of bills have been approved by members of the House, increasing the penalties for some drug crimes. Democrats against those bills have argued the punishments are disproportionate. But a separate House bill would call on an independent commission to determine whether that's true. Liz McCormick explains. House Bill 2966 would create the West Virginia Sentencing Commission. It was taken up by the House Judiciary Committee this afternoon and is sponsored by House Speaker Tim Armstead. The Sentencing Commission would look at all of the criminal penalties in state code and make recommendations to lawmakers for legislative changes. That's what House Judiciary Chair John Schott of Mercer County says is the commission's main purpose. We've had many laws on our books for decades and some new laws and during our discussions here in the House chamber, there have been uh, concerns expressed about disproportionality between certain crimes and others. So this would be an effort to, to get a, someone to take a look at that and give us some suggestions on how to, uh, how to re, re, uh, rewrite some of those. The commission would be made up of members appointed by the House Speaker, Senate President, and the Governor. Its 14 members would include two delegates, two state senators, five current or retired circuit judges, magistrates, or municipal court judges, two West Virginia citizens, the Chief Justice of the West Virginia Supreme Court of Appeals, one county prosecutor, and one public defender. Commissioners would serve in their post for two years and would not be paid for doing so. Schott says the commission would ultimately create fair and uniform sentencing guidelines for West Virginia. The commission would simply make recommendations to the legislature. They might say, for instance, a certain crime is, is the penalty is less than a, a similar crime that might uh, be um, punished much more severely and make suggestions either to lower one penalty or raise the other. Schott says the commission would also review how other states handle certain sentences as references. It's a good uh, practice from time to time to take a look at it, the overview of, take an overview of all the laws that affect a certain area and make sure that they're one consistent and, and send the same message to, to those who might break the law as well as to our, our constituents that uh, we're, we're, we're taking these problems seriously. An amendment approved by the House Judiciary Committee today would require the commission to place a special emphasis on the state's drug laws. Delegates also adopted two additional amendments adding members of the commission, including two attorneys appointed by the president of the state's bar exam and one that adds two counselors from the West Virginia Association of Alcoholism and Drug Abuse. The bill was approved by the committee and now moves to the full House for its consideration. For the legislature today, I'm Liz McCormick in the House. The House Judiciary Committee is also considering a bill to require parents or guardians to be notified if their underage daughter is seeking an abortion. House Bill 2002 was the subject of a public hearing at the Capitol this morning. The bill requires parental notification by the physician within 48 hours of the procedure. A judge can waive that notification. Supporters say girls under the age of 18 lack knowledge about the procedure, but opponents say Current notification laws protect girls who have been sexually assaulted. Here's a portion of today's testimony. 
And for these young girls, if they have lived the way I did, that is vitally important to them. You need to understand not all of us grow up like the Brady Bunch. We don't all grow up in a loving, stable environment. Sometimes the parents are not capable of making decisions in the best interest of their own children. And sometimes we have our childhoods taken away way too soon. We talk about the trust that we have with doctors. They don't tell you about the regret you have after that abortion. It's always the problem at the time. The regret, regret that when uh, I wrote for my hospital records where I had the saline abortion at 18 plus weeks and I was told that the baby was like that of liver, I regret trusting the doctors. Because two months later, this is the actual, it is March 3rd, 1975, I looked down and this is how I found out the truth. And the regret overflowed. The extremists leading the campaign to change our current law are using an emotionally explosive issue to advance a very narrow agenda. Don't be fooled. West Virginia has one of the highest parental involvement rates in the country. Nationally, 60% of teens involve their parents. Here in West Virginia, over 90% do so. Recent data from the West Virginia Vital Statistics Office shows only four young women could not inform their parents. What we're already doing in West Virginia is working and is a model for other states. I was shocked to find out there was, a, there was a way my teenage daughter could get an abortion without my knowledge or consent. I have a feeling there's many parents that are unaware of this loopholes out there. That allows our teenage daughters to make this huge life-altering decision on their own. I ask you today, how could this be? My 16-year-old daughter is not allowed to even have an ibuprofen at school without my consent. And as a teacher, I'm not allowed to give my students a cough drop or a antibiotic cream without parents' written consent. So I'm confused. How could this be that my daughter or anyone else's daughter under the age of 18 is not mature enough to take an ibuprofen, but is old enough and mature enough to have an abortion? HB 2002 actually protects abused girls because their option for a waiver to go before a judge who can intervene and help them. HB 2002 protects families from the loss of parental rights and protects minor girls from being taken for secure, secret abortions by sexual predators. The parental notification law can delay some minors and deter them from seeking care or cause them to travel out of state. This delay can expose minors to medical risk and some minors will be prevented altogether from having an abortion. For some of the minors who resort to the bypass process, that process itself will be difficult and even traumatic. The law can also subject minors to other harms, such as unnecessary stress and expenses related to delay, re reduced medical options, and in some cases, physical or emotional abuse or forced pregnancy. The House Judiciary Committee took up House Bill 2002 this afternoon, but Chairman John Schott has assigned it to a subcommittee who will likely consider the bill later in the week. We meet three representatives of Central West Virginia now in this edition of Meet Your Lawmakers. Doug Facemeyer is a Democrat from Braxton County. He was elected to the West Virginia Senate in 2008 to represent the 12th Senatorial District. Outside the State House, he owns several grocery stores across Central West Virginia. Ron Walters was first elected to the West Virginia House of Delegates in 1992. He served for four years and was again elected to the post in 2000. A Republican, he's from Kanawha County and represents the House's 39th District. Delegate Walters serves as the chair of the House Pensions and Retirement Committee. Tim Armstead is the Speaker of the House of Delegates, taking over the post in 2015. A Republican, he is from Kanawha County and represents the 40th House District. He was appointed to his seat in 1998 and has won re-election to the chamber since. Speaker Armstead previously served as the minority leader for eight legislative sessions. He also chairs the House Committee on Rules. During his State of the State address, Governor Jim Justice presented lawmakers with two plans. The first was a way to balance the 2018 budget. 
The second was a plan to raise more than a billion dollars for road construction in the state through a road bond. Since, justice has been traveling the state promoting that bond plan, but lawmakers have taken little action. Joining me to discuss the plan is Tom Smith. He's, the, he's Justice's newly appointed secretary of the State Department of Transportation. Secretary, thanks so much for being with us tonight. Thank you, Ashton. So let's start very generally. What is this plan? What is it that the governor wants to do? Well, I, I think setting the stage for the plan, we have to realize that we're getting further and further behind in West Virginia with our transportation infrastructure. It's a chronic underinvestment that despite the hardworking men and women at the West Virginia DOT, we're continuing to slip and it's becoming a chronic problem for us. Uh, Governor Justice has identified transportation infrastructure as a way to uh, not only give attention to a part of our, our economy that really needs the attention, but also to, as an economic driver to kickstart the economy. So he's identified three different types of bonds, three different ways West Virginia could create new revenue. Can you go over for me those three different types? Sure. He calls them uh, the three different buckets, and so we'll, we'll take it that way. The first of these is raising the DMV fee from $30 to $50 and also raising gas tax, the gas tax by four and a half cents. Uh, this generates on the order of about $120-some million per year, uh, which can then actually be bonded uh, in general obligation bonds uh, to some large numbers over a billion dollars. The second bucket is actually working with the Parkways Authority uh, to actually look at ways to increase the, the turnpike uh, toll rate and actually use those increased dollars to support bonding there. Uh, probably talking on something on the order of 500 to 600 million dollars uh, of bonding there with the turnpike. And then the third type of bonding, the third bucket, is using and pledging our future federal, federal highway funds. We get about 425 million dollars of those per year. Be taking a portion of those, certainly not all of those, but a portion of those to support uh, Garvey bonding. Garvey bonding has been used very successfully in West Virginia over a number of years now. Route 35, US 35 was the first place that this was used, used very successfully. And so uh, with that sort of an approach with an increased level of Garvey bonding, we think we can get a third component that gets you up to large numbers, a very bold plan, $2.8 billion. Now the governor has presented you know, several pieces of legislation that have to be approved by lawmakers to increase these fees, but then ultimately, before they can be bonded, the, the voters, they have to approve it. You have to take it out to the people of West Virginia and get their approval to do this. That's the case with the first bucket that we talked about, which was the, the bonding that's uh, using the DMV fees and the gasoline tax. It's not the case with the, the Turnpike. Uh, the Parkway Authorities has independent bonding authority, and then Garvey bonding is different. It's a different type of bonding that doesn't require the voters' approval. But for the first type, the general obligation bonds, yes, you have to go to the voters for approval there. Now there's a bill that's moving through the Senate right now, Senate Bill 477, that's come out of Senate Transportation, and that is the bill to increase the DMV fees and the gasoline tax. But at this point, there, the Senate Transportation Committee hasn't discussed anything about the bond, and we're pretty far into the session. Should this bill continue to progress, though? Is that something that the governor thinks is beneficial for the state? We're, we're putting a full court press on getting the bonding. The way that we get the economic recovery to occur in West Virginia is with the large program, and so we're going full out to go ahead and get the bonding. Investment in infrastructure is important. We've, we've ignored it. We've not invested enough in infrastructure. We're continuing to slide uh, any number of things. In a recent report card show West Virginia dropping in their place. For example, our, our bridges two years ago, we were in 12th worst place. Uh, now that we've taken the new snapshot, two years later, we're in fifth worst place. So we're definitely moving in the wrong direction. The critical thing is to find ways to invest in infrastructure. Now, the governor, as he presents these proposals, as he presented these proposals to lawmakers, he also talked about the job creation that's possible. So initially, when this came out, he was saying during the State of the State, 25,000 jobs. Now he's gone on his State of the State tour, excuse me, his Save Our State tour, and he's saying 48,000 jobs. Where do these jobs come from? Explain to me how, how we get those numbers. Okay. The, uh, the 48,000 was based on looking at projects that we had lined up over a course of several years. It was $2.4 billion. And so applying a 20,000 jobs per $1 billion of investment gets you to the 48,000 jobs. We think uh, with the type of investment we're talking about here, it could even be more. But we're using a Duke University study 
that talks about this type of uh, response uh, from an investment in infrastructure and transportation infrastructure specifically. So we're talking about more than just the initial construction jobs that, yes, that are tied to the road. Any number of types of things that happen as a trickle down aspect uh, when you look at, at, at the type of job creation you have. Certainly the immediate jobs. Uh, one of the, the nice things that Governor Justice recognizes is as you push these jobs out, you're able to immediately put people to work. So those jobs are there. But there's any number of supply chain induced uh, jobs that occur as a result of this type of investment. Now you've been traveling with the governor all across the state for these um, Save Our State tour stops all over. And he's been trying to, I guess, get the public to back him both on tax increases to balance the budget and on the tax increases to support this bond. What's the general reaction from the public as you all visit them? I, I think we've gotten a really good uh, reaction from the public. In, in every one of these cases, we've actually had a chance to highlight one of our significant projects that we've got going on, whether that was the Coalfields Expressway, whether that was the Nitro St. Albans Bridge, US 340 out in the Panhandle. My job as Secretary of Transportation is to actually talk about the importance of these projects and what happens if we don't find ways to invest in these projects. Governor Justice is very proud to talk about his plan and, and proceeds to, to tell the audience very much about the way that this would come together, the, uh, the nature of the bonding, and I think we've been very well received. I think people are really, uh, there's, there's sort of a buzz this year that I think folks would agree we haven't heard before where people are saying, yes, maybe it is time to find a way to invest in infrastructure. Now we just have a few seconds left, but you're a new face to the people of West Virginia. Why don't you tell us one of your main goals as being Secretary of the Department of Transportation? Well, I, I think front and center, my main goal is to stand up this very large bonding program to have good projects that are, are good projects for the state of West Virginia that do produce those immediate jobs. Uh, but I've worked in transportation for 37 years and I really believe in the product. So I know that this product can actually change people's lives saves lives, makes people's lives better, and that's what you get with this investment in infrastructure. Secretary Tom Smith, thanks, thanks so much for your time. Thank you. West Virginia is a state with a rich history, one that's often celebrated at the State House. And that history lives just across the Capitol complex from the House and Senate chambers in the West Virginia Culture Center. That's where we meet Joe Geiger and revisit his story tonight in the State Archives. My name is Joe Geiger. I'm the director of West Virginia Archives and History, which is a section of the, of the Division of Culture and History. Our primary purpose is preserving the, the history of West Virginia and, and, and sharing that history. I think that that's one of the more important things. It doesn't do any good to just set it up on a shelf if no one knows about that. The, the materials that we take in here at the State Archives belong to the people of West Virginia. We're just the, the caretakers for them. Uh, so it's very important that we do our job in, times, in terms of creating finding aids, in terms of digitizing materials and, and making them available. There are just so many really cool things that we have in the archives. One of my favorites, I think, is, is the uh, executive journal book that that basically records the first action of the state of West Virginia. It shows you know Arthur Borman who is the the first governor essentially uh, taking an oath that he will uphold the Constitution and carry out duties as governor of West Virginia and then it's off and running you know all the actions that he's taking as the chief executive are then recorded uh, moving forward. When we were going through the Jennings Randolph collection, uh, the constituent correspondence, it was it was alphabetized and somewhat arranged. And you know, Randolph served as a U.S. senator from 1958 until 1985. And uh, as we got into the correspondence with the G's, I was paying a little bit more attention, and sure enough, there was a letter from my grandfather, who was a United Methodist minister, uh, writing to Randolph, ur urging him to support the Voting Rights Bill of, of 1965. So it was really cool to see that, you know, that there's my grandfather, and knowing that he had written that letter, and that was his signature. We preserve the history of West Virginia. I think it's very important that we keep that connection to our past uh, as we move forward and, and plan for our future. I, I think that, that we play a very important role. I know. Uh, anytime you're doing a documentary on public broadcasting, one of the first places you're going to come is to write here to the state archives and consult the materials that we have. So it's very important that, that West Virginia has a place to preserve the, the, the most important parts of, it, his, of its history, 
uh, for the future and that's kind of what we do and again we're very involved in trying to uh, let people know what we have here so that they can they can utilize it. I mean again it belongs to the people of West Virginia. Tomorrow on our show we turn to a Democratic member of the House of Delegates who's been pushing Republican leaders to present a budget plan on a weekly basis since the start of the session. Delegate Mick Bates from Raleigh County will join us to share his thoughts on balancing the 2018 budget. And remember, you can watch the legislature at work live every day on the West Virginia channel. Tune in at 11 a.m. to watch the House and Senate floor sessions or catch them as they're rebroadcast each evening at 7. Those are also available streaming online at wvpublic.org. This has been the Legislature Today. I'm Ashton Mara. Thanks for joining us. Support for the legislature today is provided by the following. AARP West Virginia, your ally for real possibilities in the Mountain State. Online at aarp.org slash wv. West Virginia University. Online at wvu.edu. From West Virginia Public Broadcasting.